Join us now for Education Matters, a weekly look at the real people and real stories in education across North Carolina. Welcome to another episode of Education Matters presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Keith Poston. As you know, each episode we focus on a central theme or topic. This week on the show, we're going to hear from leaders representing our state school administrators as well as from Teachers Network about what's on our educators' minds as we start a new year. Like every week before we tackle the main topic, we open with a segment we call Headlines. It's a quick scan of education headlines across North Carolina and the U.S. This year, what happens in the courtroom may have a big impact on what happens in our state's classrooms. In a surprise special session just before the holidays, the General Assembly passed House Bill 17 that transfers, transfers a great deal of responsibility over education in North Carolina from the State Board of Education to newly elected Republican State Superintendent Mark Johnson. The State Board, which is led by Republican appointees, has filed a lawsuit against the General Assembly claiming the moves are unconstitutional. A preliminary hearing was held this week after we recorded this week's show, but we'll be talking about this topic in greater detail next week. Roy Cooper was sworn in just minutes after midnight on January 1st as the 75th governor of North Carolina. With a shortened transition due to the election result protest, Governor Cooper said he didn't want to waste any time getting to work. Cooper, a Democrat, becomes governor at a time when Republicans enjoy veto-proof supermajorities in both the House and the Senate. So expect the shortest honeymoon in history. Are private schools better than public schools? A new study by two education professors at the University of Illinois says no. The authors looked at test scores for private and public school students and found once you control for factors like family income, race, and location, public schools were overall getting better results from their students than private schools. The researchers believe that one reason is that even though private schools have more autonomy to choose how and what to teach than public schools, they often choose outdated curriculum and teaching methods that are more familiar and comfortable to the parents who write the private school tuition checks. Finally, a joint study committee looking at school administrator compensation at the General Assembly has made several recommendations that could result in boost to principal pay in North Carolina, which currently ranks near the bottom nationally. The General Assembly is expected to take up the recommendations when they convene later this month. Remember, you can visit the Public School Forum's website at ncforum.org, click Education Matters, and read more about each of the headlines as well as other topics we cover each week. As I said at the top of the program, this week we're going to talk to teachers and school administrators about the key issues they see in education in 2017. So joining us first, we have Catherine Joyce. Catherine is the Executive Director of the North Carolina Association of School Administrators, and we have Dr. Rodney Shotwell. Uh, Dr. Shotwell is the current president of the North Carolina School Superintendents Association and also superintendent of Rockingham County Schools. Thank you both for being here. I want to jump right in. We have a lot of issues I want to talk about. When we, I mentioned the special session uh, in the headlines, there were two bills that were introduced. Catherine, I'm going to start with you that we thought might um, actually cover some of the things that I know your group and, and superintendents are interested in. One is the K-3 class size um, uh, issue that came up out of last year's budget. Tell me a little bit about what that is and sort of what the concerns are from superintendents. So in last year's state budget, the General Assembly changed requirements for staffing in, in kindergarten through third grade. And what that means is that all school districts have to spend more of their teacher allotment dollars in those early grades, K through three. They have to have smaller classes. And they eliminated the um, exceptions to, to those smaller class sizes that had previ previously been in place. So what that's going to do is force our school districts to um, actually have larger classes in grades 4 through 12, as well as it will hurt their ability to hire specials teachers in the areas of PE, music, and art, which are all very critical to our elementary students. So, so basically, we, in order to meet that requirement that sort of, you know, sort of showed up in the budget last year, again, it, it could potentially put at risk you know, those kind of specialty teachers as well as increased class sizes in the later grades. Absolutely. We see that as an unintended consequence. We don't think the legislature realized the impact it will have on those other teachers. The focus is right, focusing on early grades and making sure they have small classes which are beneficial to students. But in working with school leaders, we want them to, to actually delay implementation of that mandate and let's work through what's the right solution so all students have the teachers they need. 
Rodney, I want to go to you. One of the other issues that we thought might come up in the um, uh, special session was calendar, uh, something <laughs> that uh, superintendents like you have been asking for for a long time. Um, calendar flexibility. Uh, right now, the uh, public schools in North Carolina basically are mandated by the, uh, the General Assembly, by the state, on when they can start, when they can stop, how many hours, something that uh, public charter schools, private schools, and others don't have to comply with. Uh, sort of what are your thoughts on that as a superintendent of how that affects you? Well, it affects us in a way of being able to uh, work with our community college. It works for first semester because their, their classes pretty much start about the same time that we start school, maybe about a week before. Uh, but the problem comes in second semester. A lot of times we're not finished with our, second, with our first semester until about the third week of January. And the community college has already started their second semester classes. Uh, by the first week or a little bit after that. And the problem happens is if the student doesn't have a community college block at the same time that they're taking a class, maybe first, uh, like if they're having it first period, but then the class they need second semester is during second period, they are already enrolled in a second period class for three more weeks before they can get over so there. So the real issue is you're trying to do as a superintendent as, and principals are trying to do what's best for the students, give them the best academic experience, but you're handcuffed in a lot of ways by sort of the, the, the mandates around calendar. Yes, sir. And, and I've been around long enough to see before it changed in 2004. And then we had some weather exemptions where we were able to start uh, about the 15th of August, which is which is reasonable. I know what happened. You know, there were several school districts that started July 30th, and that really kind of got the ball rolling. And then there were some other economic issues uh, dealing with the coast. But it really comes down to local control. Uh, you know, if if folks in your local area don't want it to happen, they're going to make sure the Board of Education doesn't vote for it. Right. All right. I want to I want to switch uh, gears on uh, and ask you about um, principal pay. There is a um, in fact, we're going to pull it up on the screen right now. We have uh, recommendations coming out of a committee of the General Assembly to look at potentially boosting principal pay, which currently ranks where, Catherine. 50th in the nation out of 51 states, including the District of Columbia. So um, what do y'all think about it? I'd like to know your thoughts from you and your members and to hear from you as well, Rodney. What are y'all thinking about um, in terms of, again, what we need to do and what the General Assembly is, has on the table? So what the General Assembly Study Committee has outlined um, include some positive steps for improving principal pay in North Carolina and we're very appreciative that they've taken this look at a very critical issue and outlined some positive steps. There is one of the recommendations which school leaders do have concerns about and that is a proposal to shift principal pay funding to a block grant and that would take the authority away from the state to set a base floor for what each principal should be paid and shift that to each superintendent having to negotiate salaries and contracts with every principal in the state. And so we're, we're concerned that if that occurs, there will be even less incentive for teachers who want to become school leaders to move into administration because they don't know what their salary could be. I'm guessing you feel the same way, Rod. You don't want to have that extra responsibility to have to negotiate separate contracts with every principal you have to hire? Well, I think it's, it creates a problem that, okay, well, you know, Johnny over here is making about $10,000 more than I am, and our schools are roughly the same size and same issues. Why was the contract over there negotiated more? Uh, or somebody who negotiated it two years ago, and now it's two years later, and the, and the going rate is a little bit higher. I think it's going to cause some issues there. But what I'm dealing with right now is I have three principals who are being paid on the teacher's salary schedule because it pays more than the principal schedule does. So we've got some issues to address. So you think, I think one of the things I've heard from your group um, and Catherine from you as well is uh, you like the idea of having a, tied to a schedule, like the teacher schedule, but you do want to have some flexibility on things like incentives for, um, you know, hard to staff areas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe in a county like yours and where you might have a little more of a challenge of recruiting people. I'm not sure if you have more challenges than say a, a Wake or Mecklenburg. <laughs> I'm guessing you probably do. Well, well, I think everybody has a hard time because, you know, a school leader, next to the teachers. The teachers are the core of, of what's happening in our schools. But you have to have a good leader in place for those teachers to rally around and work together as a team. And you know, when you're competing with sometimes supplements that are $25,000 for a high school principal in one county and you're only offering five to 8%, it, it makes a big difference. Right. One of the things that's going to come up, obviously, this is a long session. Um, for those who don't follow it as closely as you do, Catherine, that means this is when the two-year budget is set. So we're going to be talking about um, the entire budget and 
um, the, the, the lack of resources or the resources that our schools are needed. Uh, groups like yours, I know I've said that you thought there, there's not enough. Um, one of the things I hear often from legislators, just heard it yesterday as a matter of fact, that um, school superintendents like Rodney will always tell me that they don't have any money, but they always do. They got plenty of money. What do y'all think about that? I would say that they need to look at the actual trend that's happened in our public school funding and how it's spent. If you look at our state dollars going to public schools, 1% goes to central office administration. And that's where um, superintendents and their leadership team, that's where they are housed to support 2,600 individual schools in the state and 115 districts. Right. So it's a very lean administrative um, amount of dollars that we get from the state. And just real quick, Roddy, you mentioned the fund balance, which is, which is the money that you talk about mm -hmm. that you can kind of keep. Where, where, what has happened to yours in just the last, and just give me real quick on what's happened with you. Well, in. we had built the fund balance up to about $13.5 million uh, for a rainy day because we knew some hard times were coming. But now we're down to almost $2 million a year. I've got 600 less employees than I did in 2007. Well, thank you both for being here. This is, we have a, so many more of this we can talk about. <laughs> I hope you'll come back and talk to us some more. But when we come back, we're going to be joined by a Durham teacher and the head of a group that helps give voice to teachers in North Carolina. But first, as we go to break, see if you can answer this question. In 2008, there were 244 of our 2,400 principals at the top step of the state school pay schedule. How many were there in 2016? Welcome back to Education Matters. Did you correctly answer four? That's right, last year only four superintendents were at the top of the state's pay scale for administrators, down from 244 just eight years ago. Actually, 1,000 of the 2,400 principals are on the bottom step today. Joining us now to further discuss issues for 2017, we've got Catherine Correll. Catherine is the executive director of the North Carolina Teacher Voice Network. And we've got Doug Price, who's part of that network. And Doug is a sixth grade school teacher at Voyager Academy, a, a public charter school in Durham. Thank you both for being here. Catherine, I want to start with you. Um, a lot of our viewers may not be familiar with the North Carolina uh, Teacher Voice Network. Tell us about what it is and, and what it um, is doing in North Carolina. Sure. We are a apolitical, nonpartisan group of teachers. Um, we are a fellowship for 30 teachers from across the state where we train teachers in communication strategies on how policy is developed in North Carolina, on having solutions-oriented conversations with their peers, offering up resources for their peers to also elevate their voice. Um, and we create networks across the state for these fellows to lead their peers and their colleagues um, to have discussions around education issues in North Carolina um, and search for solutions together, and then be able to have relationships in place with policymakers where they can offer those solutions and brainstorm around them and, and hopefully eventually have those implemented. So it's a very grassroots approach to problem solving in the classroom. Um, and a very proactive um, way to have teachers more involved in a sustainable um, kind of systemic way in how policy is developed. Right. And I remember when you, uh, you and I talked when you were first getting, when the, the network was just getting started, you had a lot of interest, still do, and, and it seems like teachers are very hungry for opportunities to network and, and work with each other. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that there is a desire for teachers to become more authentically involved in the policy development process. Um, rather than um, just casting a vote or endorsing a candidate, but really having an opportunity to sit at the table with those making decisions and say, here are my ideas, and this is why I think they would work, and then here's the data to back that up from the perspective of my peers. Right. All right, Doug, let me go to you. Um, well, I guess first of all, you're, you're part of this network. I know you've been yep. involved in other uh, teacher organizations and, mm -hmm. and efforts. Um, I mean, why did you get involved in this, or do you think this is something that um, I mean, teachers, maybe particularly you know, folks who are still uh, fairly new in their career, like you are nine years in, sure. um, are really hungry for? Yeah. Um, so this is actually my third fellowship in the past several years, and each of the fellowships that I've done up until the Teacher Voice Network has been uh, kind of guiding me on this path of getting more in-depth into educational policy matters. And uh, 
Um, so this one seems to be kind of like the catalyst of where ed policy really happens, where I saw that um, change was coming from and where true innovation was happening from a teacher's perspective and from a school administration perspective to really be able to come to the table and be present at some of the discussions that we're having uh, for North Carolina education. Um, so prior to that, you know, with things like Keenan Fellows programs and the EPFP program with the NC Public Forum, uh, those were things that just kind of whet that appetite, but then eventually led me into the Teacher Voice Network. And, and teachers really do want to um, have a voice because really the education policy shapes your career, right? Absolutely. I mean, it, it sets um, um, your salary, um, it mm -hmm. sets your sort of career path, so that's sure. why you see it as important. Absolutely. And, you know, I've got a lot of colleagues who talk to me about, you know, these different programs that come up, and one of the things that we discuss a lot is the fact that there are so few of these programs that exist in North Carolina that give teachers the... Uh, the opportunity to come and either sit at the table or just have discussions with other leaders uh, to be able to bring their ideas, like Catherine was saying, bring their ideas to the table. Um, and so, you know, this I said in one of my uh, resume statements when I was applying to the program was that this was a ship that I wanted to sail on. I wanted to be a part of the ship that is helping to drive the innovation and drive the discussions with these uh, people who are making some of these policy uh, decisions. Well, that must make you feel good to hear things it like does, that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Um, one of the things that uh, the network does is survey teachers, not just the ones who are part of the uh, program, but uh, teachers across North Carolina. What are some of the top issues on the minds of teachers as we go into 2017 and, and looking back at last year? Sure. I, I think that there's a real um, appetite to still explore um, improving professional development, um, resources for professional development. We've seen those cut in, in recent years. Um, and I hate to always bring it back to money, but <laughs> the reality it's, it's, is resources that, are important. Yes, um, but also the quality of professional development and, and how um, the programs are structured, the support there are for them, and also how those relate directly to outcomes in the classroom and how those are measured. Um, lack of resources, I think, is one. We've seen a push for digital learning, which is tremendous. So you're talking about classroom resources, actual, yes. actual tools to do your exactly. job every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that there's, um, you know, we need to have a push towards digital resources and um, technology serves its purpose, um, but that's difficult to do if you don't have the support staff to use the digital resources mm -hmm. and the technology, um, if they're not up to date, and you need to supplement them with, with paper textbooks right. um, and other things in the classroom. Teacher pay is uh, uh, obviously an issue for you, your peers <laughs> still, yeah, right? Absolutely. And actually, you know, you were talking uh, with uh, Rodney just a minute ago about, you know, principal pay. And that's been something that was a part of the focus groups that we just recently had was the fact that you as a teacher, I currently in my position, I actually would make more as a nine-year teacher than I would if I were to step into an administration role if I wanted to be a school principal. And so that became one of the huge discussions. So we talked both about teacher pay but also about principal pay from now, that perspective. Uh, last question for you, Catherine, uh, the teacher pipeline. I mean, I'm sure that's something that comes up. These are a lot of teachers at different points of their career, but we've got a, a teacher, young teacher like uh, – uh, Doug here, we need more people going into teaching and we've got a decline. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are your teachers saying about that? I think one of the things that we're interested in as a network are, are career pathways as a way to merge the teacher pay conversation mm -hmm. with the teacher pipeline, to find ways for um, especially millennials to come into the profession and see a, a pathway to promotion, see ways that they can get further ahead within their career and not just say I'm a teacher in year one and I'm a teacher in year 30, but these are the steps in between that, that afford me more responsibility and impact in the classroom. Um, so we've had that discussion with teachers across the state on what a promotion would look like, how teachers are selected, and how they would be compensated, um, because I think that that's one way that we could um, address the recruitment issue, um, but also address other issues and how teachers are fairly compensated. Ring true for you? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I mean, I think about, you know, all of the, the, the things where I am, some of my fellow colleagues sit with some of the position and leadership roles that were given at our school, and, you know, many of them I feel are underfunded in the fact that they've got some of these heavy leadership roles both locally statewide or just within the school itself and they're not compensated or fairly compensated for those particular leadership roles. I understand. Well, look, we appreciate you both being here today. Thank you for thank the you. for the network leadership and giving teachers a voice. And Doug, thank you for what you do every day uh, for our, our kids and for, yeah. the, for, for the students. I'm sure they love you at the well, Borger Academy. Thank so you for thanks so us. much. Thank you. After the break, this week's Leadership Spotlight.
Each week, Education Matters spotlights individuals demonstrating exceptional leadership in education in North Carolina based on nominations from you, our viewers. This week, we spotlight Dr. Liz Colbert, Executive Director of the North Carolina Virtual Public School. We are the partner to the public schools of North Carolina. We don't exist without the brick and mortar campuses across the state. The difference is that the students are separated from the teacher by time and space. But the similarities are the same. Most of our students take one or two classes online with us and take the rest of the courses in their high school. At North Carolina Virtual Public School, online learning is personal. You know, we require the teachers to call the students, text with the students, I am with the students, so they can know them as people, so that they can know them as learners as well. She will gently push for what she thinks we need to do if it's going to be best for kids in North Carolina. You know, we're providing opportunities for students that they wouldn't get any other way. When we can help a student, regardless of where they live, get a course, get an assignment to pursue the dreams they want to pursue. I mean, no longer do you have to live in the big metropolitan areas. You can live anywhere in North Carolina now and have access to those courses. And that's exciting. If you know someone who deserves to be recognized, please visit our website at ncforum.org and click on Education Matters and you'll find a link to nominate someone in your community. After the break, this week's final word. We launched Education Matters in early October and it has certainly been on my mind as this new year begins. We have a new governor and a new session of the North Carolina General Assembly will reconvene in a couple weeks for what is typically known as the long session where the state's budget is set. The single largest share of that budget goes to funding education in our public schools. So even if you don't have school aged children, we all have a financial stake in our schools. But it's much bigger than that. The quality of education and educational opportunities in the state drives everything. It determines whether our children are ready to learn when they enter school. It determines whether they are prepared for college and careers and hopefully to become good citizens able to lead happy and productive lives. And it also determines whether North Carolina has the kinds of schools and graduates that businesses want when they decide whether to open or expand here. That's why we called this show Education Matters because education does indeed matter. Our goal is to help you become even more informed consumers of information about what is really going on in education. We don't apologize for our one bias, which is believing deeply in the power of public education. Thank you so much for watching and see you next week.